Hey folks, Kiltman here, Kiltman, at your services. How are you all? I hope you're all doing very, very well. Now, a little treat here for you guys now. If you're into your movies, you're into your movie soundtracks, and you love James Horner, and I know you do. Jumanji from 1995, directed by Joe Johnson, who were going to make the Wolfman remake. There's the Wolfman there. He was on a bit of a roll, Joe Johnson, at this time. And this was the Robin Williams. This was a board game which sucked you into another jungle dimension. You roll the dice, the pieces move on their own, but you're unleashing all the jungle terrors and horrors and violence and mayhem and monkeys. And Robin Williams has been sucked into this as a young child. And for 26 years, he's been missing when he's inside the realm of Jumanji. He's been hunted down by Jonathan Hyde, who's like this really weird, you know, white supremacist, big white hunter, you know? And 26 years later, another couple of kids, one of whom is the young Kirsten Dunst, who was wowing everyone with their great performance as the older vampire trapped inside the body of a young girl in the awesome, awesome Neil Jordan's uh, Interview the Vampire with Tom Cruise. And they find the game and they start rolling the dice now, he's imprisoned in there, and a certain number has to be rolled to get him back out there. This is Rob, Robin Williams as Alan Parrish. And, of course, they roll that. And he's brought back into the, well, what was 1995, the modern world. Now, these two kids have lost their parents in a horrible accident. And they moved into a new house with their auntie, Bonnie Hunt. And uh, so, obviously, all the jungle life, including mosquitoes, rhinos... Monkeys, a lion, wasps, all sorts, and giant spiders. Oh, Jesus, giant spiders are in there too. And all bedlam breaks loose in the house. You get earthquakes and monsoons, there's panic in the town, but this game controls it all. And Alan Parrish, Robin Williams, has to fight off this evil hunter again and save the day. Be re reunited with his old parents and his old girlfriend, and suddenly, I think if I remember rightly, it's many years since I've seen the movie. And I'll be honest with you folks, I wasn't that smitten with the film. I thought it was very enjoyable. Enjoyable mayhem and hokum and bedlam. And lots of industrial light and magic effects. A wash across the screen. And another great performance by Robin Williams, who I'll talk about a fair bit more. But at the end of the day, at the end of the movie, everything's right and everything's fine. And they throw the game away. Oh, the game's evil. Good God. It opens doors to other worlds. Hmm, shades of a certain Clive Barker there, and a certain lament configuration. But they hail it away. But of course, at the end of the film, another couple of kids will hear these jungle drums, and they'll find the game, and they're like, oh, it's all going to start off all over again. You know the score. And obviously, there was a cartoon made of it, there were sequels made, there was a remake made, and then a sequel to the remake, I think. I think. There's a lot of Jumanjis out there. It's a Jumanji rife world. And the score was by James Horner. Yes, James Horner. The late, great James Horner. I've discussed him so many times on the channel. I've discussed his music and I've talked about the movies he's been involved in and spent a huge amount of time discussing the music with inside, inside the movie reviews as well because his music is so indelible. He has his detractors and I've said this all along. Uh, they always condemn him for self-plagiarization and for ripping off the likes of Prokofiev and Shostakovich. Do you find any film composer that does not rip off the classics? You know, of course they do. If even the likes of John Carpenter can rip off on players an interpretation of Engulfed Cathedral by Debussy for Escape from New York and play on synthesizers, and he's the king of electronica and synth scores, and even he did it, you know, everyone does it. And the thing about James Horner's repetition, the use of his certain motifs, the danger motif, of course, the anvils and all of that, the, uh, the ethnic woodwinds, which you can hear a lot of in this score, repeating throughout movie score to movie score, I have never found that like, oh, he's ripping himself off again. I've heard that a million times before. I've loved it. It's almost like welcoming in and, you know, an old friend, an old musical friend that brings you into this new adventure but it embraces you with a sound that you know and you've loved before. But it will go through enormous permutations 
and his scores are wildly diverse anyway. So I've always loved his stuff, loved it. And even though I wasn't, you know, a massive sort of, oh, Jumanji, wow, it's great. Can't wait to watch it again. I'm not even sure if I've watched it more than once, to be perfectly honest. Uh, <laughs> but the score was phenomenal. Uh, it is, to, to encapsulate it all, it's exotic, it's mysterious, it's beautiful, it's lyrical, it's thunderous, it's eerie, it's James Horner gold, it's fantastic. They had an initial release, of course, and now we get the fully expanded version from our great friends over in California, Intrada. I've known and loved Intrada for decades now. I've re reviewed a lot of their stuff many times before, even in the written format, that old archaic way of, you know, typing words out, as opposed to getting a quill pen out and, or daubing it in blood, you know, on a cave wall, but typing it out and sending it off to websites and, oh, that gets published. Wonderful old days. Now I just sit here and play the music and talk about it, which is a lot easier to do, to be perfectly honest. But Intrada have just released, it only came out like literally a day ago, uh, Jumanji on a double disc edition. And you've got the original CD presentation, the original album presentation, which runs just over 50 minutes. And then you get the expanded version as well, which runs, what is it now? I'll just find out for you. Hang on a second. Uh, the full version is 70 minutes and 36 seconds. Plus you get some extra tracks as well. A bit where the certain instrumentation is taken out, certain effects are taken out, or all 10 tracks. So you're getting a deluxe treatment of a film score, which is absolutely fantastic. So let's, you're hearing it now, and you're hearing the fake new, the off-paired anvils of James Horner. They're in Aliens, they're in Titanic, they're in so many. They're in Star Trek, oh God, but I love them. So as I say, James Horner had scored all of Joe Johnson's films up until this point, and without a doubt, this is the most dynamic, richest, and most overboard um, score that he had done for Joe Johnson. So there was the outline of the story. Let's listen to some of the tracks. The original, uh, album is remastered on this release as well so it sounds crisper cleaner warmer more beautiful and um, there's a lot more clarity to it and the expanded album which is the complete score that James Horner wrote which is not what you hear in the movie and this is the thing about these expanded releases um, you're going to get what the composer came up with right there's the script there's the film you're composing and writing to the film but the film will, will change there's always editing, there's always like bits and bobs redone, scenes removed, scenes shortened. So what happens to a score? All that laborious writing and composing and, you know, conducting suddenly has to be, when in a finished article, it's shortened, some tracks are repeated to cover a certain scene, which the original track no longer fits because of timing and editing. So there's a vast difference in the sound of a fully expanded score when you hear everything the composer created for that movie as to what you actually hear whilst watching the movie. And I always find this a really hugely satisfying experience. I mean, I'm one of those that I, I want the bigger, longer scores. Sometimes it doesn't it doesn't work. Sometimes the longer score with the extra bits in between the cues that you knew, you knew and loved from the movie and from the initial release on album. Uh, it kind of dilutes all that. It's happened. I can't think of an example right now, but there are examples where it, you're kind of like, hmm, I, really, I don't really want that bit. But the beauty of the modern world is that you can make your own playlists. You can chop and change the stuff around to your heart's content and make your fantastic individualized playlist of a score that you know and love. So, it's an exotic score. So you've got all these woodwinds in there. You've got the shakuhachi, the Japanese bamboo flute. I probably pronounced that wrong. You've got the kina, which is a, a South American uh, woodwind flute from the Andes. And the kina plays in a more sort of tranquil, idyllic sort of fashion to you know, coax you into this world of this exotic jungle and this weird board game, this supernatural board game. That is not shakuhachi or the kina, but the shakuhachi Actually, the, the Japanese bamboo flute becomes more sinister 
and both of these will permeate the score and give little delicate timbres and flavours to reflect on what's happening and who the character is. It's also a very leitmotif driven score, so there's thematic elements here. Characters have certain elements which are repeated throughout the score. Now there. Now which one was that? Is that Shakurachi or is that the Kina? One of you. Oh, well, I'm not. If you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. But this is a nice bit of Mysterioso creeps in here. Because things are about to go hellish. The new kids have discovered the game. So let's discover what happens next. You've got a, this is Bats in the Attic or the End Off, but we're gonna go on to Monkey Mayhem because they're gonna bring in, each roll of the dice, they're bringing in elements like, like bloody wasps come in and all sorts. And then you hear clattering downstairs and, and there's little monkeys in the kitchen. The monkeys reappear. I think the kid, the new kid, the boy that's with Kirsten Dunst, the, the brother and sister, he turns into a monkey at one stage and uh, he looks more like the Wolfman now, to be perfectly honest. Uh, which is a good thing as far as I'm saying. And I can't remember quite why that happens. But anyway, and he will save the day, trying to save Alan Parrish, Robin Williams, who you're going to hear the music when he gets, gets brought back into the modern world and discovers how things have changed. But let's listen to this. There's elements of aliens and... God, so many other movies that you know and love. Something wicked this way comes, springs to mind. Again, children in uncovering a supernatural world. The Shakuhachi played in there as well, against the anvils. Very great shades of aliens there. The accelerating trumpet there. Sure, that's the end of the wasps actually attacking him initially. Hmm. Cheers, by the way. And cheers to Roger Fiegelstein and um, Regina Fiegelstein and Douglas Fake from Entrada. Once again, you've delivered a fantastic release. These people scour the, the vaults. Long sc scores, the, the full elements have been missing for decades they seem to find them restore them remix them monkeys there's an umpire band baseline klaxons there's a crazy synth in there sizzling stuff going on warped abandonments it's carnival it's circus it's bedlam Now that brings to mind elements of Joe Johnson's and James Horner's earlier collaboration on Honey I Shrunk the Kids, which has some spectacularly great chaotic carnival-esque music like that. You'll hear that again, because that is the monkeys sort of theme. Not the hey hey with the monkeys, not that, not that crowd. Raucous. You can just imagine clowns tumbling around. I'd rather have mad monkeys than clowns tumbling around, wouldn't you? In your kitchen, you know. Same track. Can you see how he does this? You've got the warmth, you've got emotion, which we'll come across, we'll discuss a lot. You've got chaos, frenzied activity, action, menace. Suspense, exotic tribalism, and then you get a humanistic, quieter quality, and then the warmth of those Horner-esque, well, not Horner-esque, it is Horner, pure Horner strings, those big sweeping long line strings, which really suck you in, break your heart in many cases too. Oh yeah, we're gonna run the whole gamut here because everything is in this score. Everything you love about Horner is here in this score. So now, this is the same track again. You've gone chaos and bedlam to quiet eeriness and menace. And that's how he does it. He mixes all this together. 
I'm talking a lot over this, I know, but... Uh, and where'd that come from? That sort of um, heightened... I'm not sure what the, the phrase is for it, but it builds and builds and builds on the note. You hear it in all of his scores. Braveheart, Troy. Now that, I would say, was the keener. Which you would hear in the likes of um, A New World and Legends of the Fall, even. It makes a great appearance there as a tri North American Indian tribal element. Both flutes were there, by the way, Shakuhachi and Akina. So you've, you've got trombone, bass trombone, and you've got the clarinet and the bass clarinet, contra bassoon. The full orchestral hit is, is all there. It's a vast um, orchestra. Now this, this is Alan Parrish, Robin Williams discovering that he's been brought into this new world now. He's discovering what's happened. I don't really recall what he discovers that's so bizarre and weird, other than the fact that maybe I'm a lot older now and I've lost my parents. Uh, Piano, gentle woodwinds, lovely, sincere strings. This playful quality. James Horner had, had a very spiritual side, and his music captures that. Even in some of the most sort of unorthodox films. Films like Wolfen, which I've discussed so many times, when he, he the, the danger motif, uh, anvils, and all sorts of raucous action and suspense was in there. But did you notice again the American, Native Americans? There's so many lovely, lovely, gentle moments. Not as warm as this, though, I will say. Gentle. Celeste and Harp feature a lot together in this. Denoting a very fragile line of human emotion, loss, mourning, reawakening. Awakening? That was Robin Williams, wasn't it? People say I throw these things together, you know. There's absolutely no other composer that's ever reached in to my soul and my heart and touched me as much as James Horner ever did. And I love all the great, I love, you know, well, you know, of course, I've covered him a lot of times. But even as a child, it was James Horner's music which really struck me. Powerful, exciting, and yet could really break your heart as well. Or... Parade mad monkeys right in front of you, doing what monkeys do. Naughty, stop that. Like mad xylophone. It's a synth, this demented synth line. It's, it's just, it's pure chaos, isn't it? How could an orchestra not love to come up with this? The umpa bit like... The tail off. Because I don't think, you couldn't sustain that kind of activity for too long. You'd lose your mind. That beautiful piano. And again, you've just gone from madness to 
serenity and realization. Of the brass, that brass line. It's almost there, she. The Wizard of Oz moment, the opening, you know? I've always got emotional with James Horner's music, always. That ability to just get inside you and just pull the heartstrings, gently pitter patter on your soul. It's gorgeous, isn't it? It's gorgeous. This film and its score, Horner would revisit with the Spider Bit Chronicles. Which is very similar in many, many ways. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, this and uh, Spider Bit Chronicles feature kids and families involved in a supernatural adventure. Science got awry, or literally just, you know, other, uh, another realm. Particularly this and Spider Bit Chronicles, where someone is lost for a huge amount of time and then has a sort of reawakening and then a re meeting with people. And Horner's music captures all that. There's a thing about Robin Williams as well, who is so outstanding. I mean, I knew him from Mork and Mindy, and then he began to make movies, and he had this incredible ability. You just expected zany antics from him, and I've seen, you know, well, I've seen videos of his live shows. I've never seen a live show live, and, uh, and he was rip-roaring, crazy, chaotic guy, uh, really pushing the boundaries, but anarchic and just non-stop. The energy was unbelievable. But when he started acting in movies, I think the first film I saw him in was uh, Survivors with Walter Matthau. And there is a truly, truly wonderful moment in that when it made me realize I'm gonna keep playing that because if, if suddenly chaos comes on, it'll just ruin a moment. Uh, they, they, they join a survivalist group and they go out into the wilds, you know, in Canada or somewhere. Walter Matto is all dressed up, but the Robin Williams character is broken hearted and losing the plot and he strips off in the cold and like Walter Matto's like, what are you doing, what are you doing? He's like, I'm, I'm being real, this is reality, I'm, it's it's real, yeah, and he's going like, it's, it's real cold, and he goes, yeah, I'm freezing. And you see Walter Matto, great actor of course, and a tear in his eye, and he goes, come here, and he puts his coat around him and hugs him. And that broke my heart. And it, it's then that you realise that an actor like him, anarchic, crazy, there's a dark side. Like many clowns have a dark side to them. And it's here as well. James Horner seemed to capture that, that fragile line of upbeat action, positivity, buoyancy, but he, he counterbalanced it with, look, at that, that facade can crack at any time and you can fall. So his tragic music is all the more searing and memorable. And his action is fantastic as well. <laughs> and his suspense is, you know, par excellence. But it's that lovely line that he always struck. And it's all coming out now since his death, of course, James Horner now, uh, that he was a very spiritual man and a very insular sort of man as well. And this crazy uh, workshop, composing room, look on YouTube and you'll, you'll see it. His wife. <laughs> he had a wife, you know. <laughs> what? Uh, takes us on a tour of this room. And you see his daughter as well. And uh, it's a crazy, crazy room full of clockwork stuff and weird contraptions. It's Aladdin's cave. Aladdin, Robin Williams was Aladdin, uh, the genie, of course. But he had this hugely 
spiritual side and he would focus into the music and watching that and learning from his family just what a man he was that it's so different from what you thought when you listen to all the music and you see the films his music embraced and Robin Williams was clearly the same you know Robin Williams took his own life which is unbelievably tragic but also not that surprising <laughs> thank you James that'll be enough of that for the time being we'll bring it on to this but Robin Williams obviously there was this darker underside to him and even and in his movies you could see that that's why the actor could do this even um, Steve Martin could do it as well Steve Martin even in a film LA is it LA Story uh, where he, he he's the weatherman and he wishes the uh, the weather to change to stop his, his wife he wants to keep his wife with him and she's about to fly out and he, he makes the weather change but in that scene look at Steve Williams Steve Williams <laughs> Steve Martin's face and why is it that comedians can do this? It's because they're all walking that knife edge. What you see on stage, what you see in most movies when they're being their normal, crazy, comical side is one side of the coin. But don't flip that. There's a dark side. And maybe that's how they have to... Maybe that's how it works. I don't know. I'm not a comedian. But, you know, I think maybe that counterbalance has to be there. And James Horner had this seemingly had this element too uh, obviously he didn't well he did kill himself by crashing his plane composers please take note take note <laughs> do not fly planes right come on let's get into some more of this so you've got a lot of mysterious and eeriness building up to certain moves and like what's going to come through this game next. You've got a weird plant monster as well, haven't you? I'm just looking at the, uh, the, the track that we've got. The next track here is Plant Almost Eats Peter. Now, you know, this starts off very similar to what you just heard there. Shivery, sort of tremolo. Woods, a lot of horns playing this as well. Horner was loved his horns. Icy sliding strings. So this this plant. I'm not sure if it's big or it's it's just got tendrils and it tries to drag it. I can't remember. Halo themes creep back in. He's a master at doing this. His motifs, they can weave in and out. Is it Audrey from Little Shop of Horrors? That build up, that suspense, the horns playing, and then this. Seesawing, scissoring of the strings, that's pure horning. If you just got played that 30 seconds, 20 second piece, you go, that's James Horner. I love that. I love that you know straight away who a composer is. We haven't even hit all the action yet, you know. There's so much more. <laughs> I also love like the fade outs, the, the, the tail end of a, of a shivering, exciting piece of music, and then it just descends and slides slowly out. Here's the hunt of Jonathan Hyde. He plays two roles, if I remember rightly, he plays two roles in the movie. He plays the father of somebody. <laughs> I can't remember if it's the father of the Robin Williams character, Alan Parrish, or it's the father of the two kids. Because they, they seem to be vet time and everyone's happy at the end. But...
that's Shakuhachi, that. Because that's, that's the most sinister element. It's also playful. The brass coming in there. Good snare drums. Isn't it beautiful? And now you're not picking up the more the more delicate, finite elements of the score. Because that's just what I'm playing it on right now, and the way that you're going to listen to it here. But when you get you get this CD release, oh my god, the clarity of it is unbelievable, and the warmth of it as well. Just that. That's the, that's the triangle. See again, these cues, these tracks, build, you have, you have suspense, and then build and flourish, and then you get the, the gentler moments, they're all part of it. It's so cleverly done. Okay, now we'll get Stampede. Because they bring all sorts of beasts to. You see, there's lines. And the CGI at the time was, uh, it was, it was actually really, really good. And you had lots of, like, ILM. Uh, there was puppetry involved in it as well. I mean, them spiders. Oh, Jesus Christ. And, like, I think they're stuck in, they're halfway stuck in the floor. And these spiders are coming towards them. And they're not, they're not little house spiders. They're great big, bloody huge. Even the jungle doesn't have spiders like that. Unless you're on Skull Island. Again, if you're playing the James Horner, spot the cue bit. That's Troy. You hear that again in Troy. You hear it in Mass Mazzaro. You hear it in so many. It's it's just, it's a stylistic trick. But look how he, he dovetails it down. Get another hornerism. And then a delicate floating sense of, oh God, what's gonna happen next? Can we do it? The woods, I, I, I the woods and brass together. Uh, the king of that is John Williams, but Overall, I still much prefer James Horner's music to John Williams. I love John Williams. Okay, let's let's get into some craziness. I do. Apo I apologise. I get confused as to which. Of, the, of those uh, flutes is playing. Well, that's warped instrumentation, but listen to the strings behind it. Cymbal clashes, but the strings are soaring up and down behind this as well. Through earphones, there's so much dynamics taking place, going through, blaring and bleating, you know, through your skull. But when you play it, if you've got a good sound system and a good, you know, a good room uh, to embrace all those acoustics, wow! It's just, it's an, it's better than the film. It's better than the film, you know. Like these little. 
quieter moments. You can feel the music dotting around the room and floating up, soaring, dropping, soaring again, coming up behind you. Oh, it's like, oh my God. I often play music through with the air. I've got the big cinema room with the big, big screen and speakers all around the room. And I often play music through that. That's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's quite an experience, I can tell you. Some of the percussive effects that he achieves as well. You've got um, a Super Bowl dragged, scraped across a tam tam. It's a big gong. Scraped across that. In other elements, you've got like a plastic cup scraped across it as well. Just to create these weird percussive noises. Oh, folks, if you're fans of this movie and this score, we are going to play the full Jumanji track. Of course we are. I think you guessed that already. There's also a, I think it's a Japanese, the Air Who, Japanese uh, two-stringed uh, instrument, which is just absolutely gorgeous when you hear it quite a lot. that. So bring in a harp with percussive action cues. Take some doing that, you know. I, see, I, love, I love this. You get this shrill moment of like, oh my god. And then do, 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 do. This little gentle bridge. It brings the suspense down and just doesn't stop it. And you hear that that builds again. Listen. That's very classical, that. Big bass drums. Is it xylophone? It's, it's probably no way. It's probably bone shards that they're using, like and fossilized, you know, eye sockets to hit. How clear that is! I like just sustained, uh, suspended cymbal clashes. Just monkeys. It's great, is that? That's addictive, that isn't it? What the hell is that? I don't know what I'm not sure what that was. There is extensive uh, liner notes by John Takis, which are typically brilliant. His stuff's always fantastic. He writes brilliantly about these movies and the scores. It's an extensive booklet you get with this as well. There you see again, the motif comes in. This late motif. It's almost like, you know, one of them, one of them South African things. Playing with football matches, drives everybody mad. I forget what it's called now. Shakovachi. It's the everything's coming together now. But you've still got a monsoon and an earthquake and all this. Oh, the film just doesn't stop, it just, when it lets rip, it's crazy. Like threats near. That's for like this hunt, just Jonathan Hyde hunting. 
That's that's for him. That's, that denotes him. The uh, the, the devil's uh, moti, the tritone, that features a lot. I mean, Horner used it a lot anyway. And like, <clears throat> the clergy hated this type of medieval music because it denoted devilry. Horner would use it a lot, you know. That's many, like Alan Silvestri, everyone, everyone uses it. So yeah, you've got this chaos. And then you bring this sprightly moment in as well. Okay, what's this, what's this track? See, I mean, folks, I've only just got this um, release. But I wanted to try and get the uh, the video out there to spread the word because it's so outstanding. It's not limited. I don't think it's a limited edition. It's not limited. So you get your orders in. I'll, I'll put links below as well. But if you're into your soundtracks, you know who in trial it are. You know where to get your stuff from. Uh, but I will put a couple of links below in the uh, description. Combines a forlorn element, a pensive moment with a forlorn, almost melancholy element, but he manages to, to, to underscore it with a bit of playfulness. <laughs> Who'd have thought that? And who'd have thought it would work? You know. This is the monsoon. In all honesty, I don't remember too much about uh, the sequence with the monsoon. <laughs> I just, I just don't. I need to watch the film again. I, I'm massively inspired to do so because I listened to this. But you know, now we're getting. To, this is towards the end of um, the score and the movie. But let's listen how Horner brings all his elements together. The action, the suspense, the eeriness, the tribalism will all come together and then will lend on rich, warm humanity and emotion. And then perhaps a wee bit of suspense afterwards of like, what's going to come next? Because some other kids do find that Jumanji board, you know. Turn a bit more, you know. oh, that's a nice horn line there. It's a sense of like what what would become Titanic. Bamboo flute is now playing an action cue. All plaudits to Douglas Fake and Entrada. He's the guy that's put this all together, you know, overseeing the production. Bamboo flute that's playing an action cue. Normally it's just like you know, denoting rainforest and stuff. If here is part of an action cue and it's getting the adrenaline 
racing. I love symbols, you know, you can imagine it in someone who hasn't got a clue what they're doing. I'm like, no, I want symbols now. You, you could destroy, you could completely destroy a really uh, atmospheric cube. I want symbols now. Like, oh, beesh, oh, what was that about? And even the orchestra would be going, like, why am I doing this? No, boosh, boosh, boosh. It's knowing where to put instruments in to a, a cue to a track to weave elements together and disparate instrumentation and oh, the harp so again the harp playing alongside big orchestral bombast and cymbal clashes you know Dodgy ground, how would you make that way? So it drops and becomes more earnest. What's coming next is the huge Jumanji. Cue, which is the best part of 12 minutes. Um, now, it, they they did record this in one long take, but it does have edits in it, uh, film-wise and album-wise. But you're going to get the full hit now. Oh, I just the, the sun is now beating down outside. And I long to be outside in it. And this sort of music, you know, the ethnic, the tribal elements, with our big lush garden there. I know, you guys have seen the Kilt Mansions garden, or part of it, you've you always seen part of it. Uh, <laughs> the messy part of it. The other bits are messier, <laughs> they're the messier parts of it. This is Jumanji. This is this is the big track. Everything comes together in this. And yeah, we're gonna turn it up a bit. Serious that isn't it? That's we're on edge here. It's make or break. And it's so, it's so pure, James Holland as well. It's when you're like. Late 70s, early 80s, James Horner does sound different to all of this from like the late 80s to the, the 90s. It just becomes bigger, more emboldened, more sincere, more, uh, you know, uh, heartbreaking, more exciting, all together at once. But he had that back then, but with smaller resources. Reaching the end, and I can't remember what the ending really was. <laughs> I can't remember the climax of the movie, the big finale. I don't remember it. 
I'm done with a happy ending, but I don't remember all this. But there's gotta be monkeys involved somewhere. Horner creates stuff like this in a stream of consciousness. He works and works and works, but he's focused entirely upon this particular you know, uh, cue, the sequence. And all these elements of the story will weave in and out of that. But no, he conceives it as like this is the track, whether it's 30 seconds long or it's 12 minutes long or even longer, you know. This is what it takes, this is what I've composed for this sequence, for this element of the movie. So you get all these different motifs will come in. And that's what's so great about it. All the composers will break this down into several different tracks and cues. But no, to him it's, it's a constant thing, it's ever moving. It's an orchestral piece, it's a symphony. And he's conducting as well, like, oh, yeah. Shakurachi. Sinister, more guttural. And I can't remember what's happening during this sequence. I genuinely can't. But I don't need to. My mind, and yours will too, will tell you a different story. By well, listening to this music now, you, 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 your mind's weaving its own adventures, its own incredible little tale is unfolding between your ears. The trumpets there. Oh no, it's, it's horns. Sorry, it's horns. It's like... A victory. There is elements of the perfect storm as well. I've always realised that, yeah? Which will come later than this. And I've discussed that, that score and that movie uh, before. Oh, God, I've done, I've done loads of them. But I hadn't captured the perfect storm uh, element there. And again, as I say, it's not, that's not a detraction. It's only if you're a fan, you know, it's just like, oh yes, he's brought, or not, he's brought that in. He used, he would use that kind of flourish for Perfect Storm. I mean, how can you not an, art, an artist, artiste, for using elements that he knows and loves again and again and again and putting them into different sort of formats and different styles? Look at Stephen King, look at Dean R. Koontz, look at James Hill, it's all the, you know, the great write, horror writers, or, you know, and P.D. James, Agatha Christie, they're all using the same bloody thing every time, every single time. No one ever skits them, do we? No one ever goes, oh, you're just, you're just plagiarising yourself. So why do you leap on James Horner? Why? Someone out there, tell me why you don't like James Horner, why you hate on him so much. Because there's many more that love him than you guys that don't like him. And no one's forcing you to like him either, you know. I only say this because I see this on forums so much. Oh, not James Horner again. Oh, just he, he, 
one note James Horner. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Film scoring politics as well comes into all this. We're still on Jumanji, this great big gargantuan track. Can you imagine being in the orchestra when certain elements, brass, horn, strings have gone to the stratosphere and then you've got to suddenly stop that, bring it down with like a, dis a distant suspended cymbal and then you bring in the gentle strings and the harp. They're probably sitting there where, when's my bloody chance? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I want it, right. We've won, and now I think we're meeting our long lost parents, and we're meeting our long lost son. Oh, I can't, can't remember how it all works out. Nobody can't. <laughs> Sorry about that. I should, I should know. I could tie it all in a lot better, but. Kina. That's the, the one from the Andes. See, it's more, it's sweeter. It's more soaring. It's not, you know, not, not, not punching through with some guttural, shrill. And apologies there, my daughter did cough somewhere down down yonder. Some people have no respect, do they? Imagine the recording sessions and someone coughs and be like, <laughs> Right, brass action, turn upon the strings now. Get the girl playing the Celeste, do it. <laughs> she coughed. Okay, that's the, the, the pensive sort of finale. Uh, this has been quite good because I, I've let pretty much a lot of the, these tracks just play out into each other. I genuinely hope you've heard some of these without, I know I'm talking over it, but I can't just sit and play the stuff for you. I've got to discuss it. You know? Peter, Judy, and parents. Now these are the um, the Kirsten Dunst and her brother, and they're reunited with the parents that they'd lost. It's not so it's not like heartbreaking though, is it? Because it's a pleasant moment, it's a 
uplifting moment. But after all it's gone before, it, it can't be like, woo, yeah, cock a hoop and like, let's break, break everyone's hearts. End titles. Everything will come into play here. If you take nothing else away from this, take monkey mayhem. Monkeys playing with their bits, messing around, destroying things, chucking things, like doing things with their own bodily bits and bobs and throwing it at you. And how'd you go from that to the half and the celeste? See, James Hornet, an incredible sad loss to the, the art of crafting movie scores and creating music in general. An incredible fella, you know, and uh, I'm 52 years old now, I'll be 53 this year, and uh, next month as it, as it transpires. But I discovered his music from like, the humanoids from the deep and the hand, you know, back in the, well, late 70s, early 80s, and Star Trek II and Wolfen were the ones that really cemented that name I saw in the film, you know, titles, music by James Horner. Oh, no, I don't. And then I, even at that tender age of 11 and 12, you know, 13, uh, I, I, I knew his stuff. And then, you know, throughout the 80s, Uncommon Valor, you know, uh, God, Glory. Is it Glo Glo was Glory out in the 80s? I can't remember now. But so many others. Commando, 48 hours, another 48 hours, Red Heat. Truly <sighs> unbelievable. The Dresser, you know, unbelievable scores with that rich thematic quality that you recognise and you love and cherish. People, again, again, you know, I'm saying this and denouncing the people that, that denounce James Horner. If you derive pleasure from something and you don't mind hearing the same sort of motifs again and again, and it just endears you all the more to that composer and opens up the world of that film score and that film itself, how could you ever, ever not that? It's just a welcoming home. Yes, you know me, you know what I do. Well, I'm working on this story now, and I'm gonna bring you in. All those things you, you've loved before, they're gonna be here, but I'm telling a different story now. Musically, I'm telling a different story, but you're gonna get that. And I know people are gonna like, well, I don't like that. <laughs> I want something different. Well, you know, the world is big and diverse. Just, you know, don't have to enjoy it. If you don't like it, you don't like it. But just don't don't hit on it either. You know, it's not worth it. There are so many of us that are devoted to the likes of James Horner and people like Entrada are who have been absolute unbelievable champions of James James Horner's music for so long now. And it's it, 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 it's it's a gift that's kept on giving. We've loved what was put out before about these movies and their soundtracks, but in trial they've gone in and taken more and more and found more and more and brought them out, restored them, remixed them, and delivered all the bits that you wanted to hear but never even knew existed, you know? And they put it out there. Drums. Oh, I will play the uh, the bits that uh, are not on the initial album. Uh, they're in the film. They're not on this particular score. I'll play a couple of those extra bits, the drums, you know. People love that, I see, the drums. I do, I, I love tribal drums. It's 
See this? It end, it's ending on like a... Mm, Jumanji's not gone. But the kids have found it. It will return with Dwayne Johnson. I haven't seen any of the sequels or any of the other uh, remakes. Do a little bump up, a slight hiccup in it. Sort of sustained and processed symbol clash, giving like a, a whooshing wind effect. Beautiful. Okay, okay, let's get on to. All right. Let's go on to. Hang on a second. Where the bloody hell is it? my fault now. You want your tribal drums? This is what lures the kids in. This is what you hear in the movie. People rave about that <laughs> for some reason. It's nice, it's, it, it's atmospheric, it, it's exotic, but it's uh, it's also not particularly amazing at the same time. <laughs> right. I just want to go back onto something. Let's go into it. We didn't discuss this. This is the, uh, the prologue and the main title. A lot of elements come into this. It was all going so well, then. So this is set back in a, a much earlier period. Is am I right? Am I right? Is this an earlier time before even Robin Williams, Alan Parrish, finds the game? He's being chased by bullies, loses his bike, and the girl brings the bike back to him, and they discover the game. His dad's got a shoe factory, so, or something like that. I don't remember. I don't remember. This is a lovely opening, actually. That's oh, great, you know. This is weird. We're going back to the beginning now. <laughs> Face nothing. You go from that to this. How? How, how? how do you work that out? How do you compose that? And any orchestra to think that oh that's gonna work. We're leaping from this to this and like uh, what? Hey? But Hornus music gave everybody in a big orchestra a, a, a chance to shine. 
your woods, your strings, your brass, the horns, your percussion. Everybody gets their, their moment. And they get a moment, a flourish of their own stuff. And then at some point, they'll combine bits together. And then you'll get the big orchestral, massive wallop of the finale. And the finale might actually be in the middle of the track. What sounds like a big finale to you? And then it will tail out for another two minutes with other bits and bobs to gently take you out of the maelstrom. It's great, great at doing this. And we're not going to get any more, James Horner. New scores, I mean, you're not going to get any more. Which is such a shame. But you know, once we all go into the next adventure, he'll be up there. Whatever up there is, um, he'll will have a lot more to enjoy from James Horner and Bernard Herrmann, you know, and many other many other composers. Elmer Bernstein, you know, Jesus. So this is the original where Robin Williams' Alan Parrish finds the game. Being chased by bullies, he's got his bike nicked, finds the game, meets a girl that brings his bike back, I think, and the two of them play the game, and it all begins again. See, I've, we've just done what the film does. The game's resurfaced, and now we're going through it all over again. <laughs> no, we're not. No, we're not. Because I'll tell you why, because I'm going, I'm going to the pub. I've almost finished this, so I need to go and... Um, I mean, look, I can't give my liver a chance to repair itself. Good God, no! And plus, we've got exotic sunshine out there right now. I know you guys can't see it, but, you know, trust me, it's there. So, folks. Intrada's fabulous new double-disc release of Jumanji from 1995, James Horner, film directed by Joe Johnson. Uh, whether you love the film or you don't, uh, the score is absolutely incredible. It, it, it covers every emotion that a human being can have. Excitement, suspense, fear, uh, love, devotion. Everything is there. It's all there. Heartbreak. Everything is there. And there's no other composer, to my mind, um, and I, people can, you know, obviously let me know. Well, if, in fact, do, do let me know the composers that you guys love, that you, you want to hear. Maybe more uh, reviews of their stuff, uh, because I can, I can do it. I'll have their stuff. I have a collection of, I have no idea how many soundtracks I have. Absolutely no idea. But I will have the soundtracks from composers that you guys love. Um, so, you know, if you want me to cover stuff, um, I, I'll always have to do so. Um, but Intrada have really knocked this out of the pile with a lavish, beautiful uh, release of Jumanji. Long awaited, and it's a fabulous score. And the extra 20 minutes really do embellish the score and make it more impactful and give it more there's more little moments in between the cues that you knew before and you get extra elements there and again those those extra elements always creep in bits that you knew before but give it a whole new slant it's all the more exciting because of it it blends together really well it is a wonderful experience even divorced from the movie Anvils. Me and James Horner. We, we love our anvils, we does. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get myself an anvil. But I'm not getting that game. You know there. You ever seen that game, Jumanji? I've heard terrible things about it. People that play it just they're gone. You're better off with a Ouija board. Folks, I have been the Robert Shelby Cutman. Please keep it Celtic, keep it Celtic. And please go and watch Jumanji, which I need to do to remind myself 
is what the film was really all about. And, uh, and get this soundtrack. If you're into your movie soundtracks, Entrada are absolutely knocking these things out of the park all the time now. We've got more coming as well. <sighs> Legends of the Fall, Expanded, please. Willow, Expanded, ooh, maybe, maybe, who knows, who knows. I'm gonna cover more of these, um, so anyway, folks, namaste. One day I'm gonna work out what that, what that word means, but apparently it's good, so anyway, I'm gonna see you all You see, I was doing the full hit of what James Horner comes up with. Everything was there, the highs, the lows, the, 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 the fade outs, it's all there, and the heartstring pulling. So, there you go, folks. Jumanji, from Entrada, get it. <laughs>